Hello. So we'll be going to talk a little bit about cryptocurrencies now. Uh, even though the name of the talk is uh, Cryptocurrency for Dummies, uh, this is not a talk for dummies, so it's intended for the CodeBeats audience. So even though I have simplified some things to make it fit into the, the one hour, um, I'm going to talk about the, the full protocol and how really uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies work. First, a little bit about me. My name is Miguel. I'm a PhD student in robotics and AI here at ISTE in Lisbon. I like to think of myself uh, as a, a geek, a hacker, and a maker. Uh, and I'm a very big sci-fi, tech, and robotics enthusiast. I've also been uh, affiliated with a few uh, organizations such as uh, IEEE. Uh, I'm in the student branch at the university. We organize a bunch of events there. Uh, I've helped organize the Nodecopter, the first Nodecopter event in, in Lisbon. And uh, I've been formerly affiliated with Google Developer Groups, and I'm doing research for Institute Telecomunica Soish IT. Um, so the, just to give you an outline of, of the talk, first I'm going to be, give a, a bit of context of what is this thing of cryptocurrencies, uh, to talk about how transactions occur and what is the blockchain. Then what is this mining that you hear about, mining Bitcoin and so on. Then some of the problems. And uh, recently, uh, some altcoins, uh, alternative coins, have started popping up, and I'll be giving an overview of that. And in, in the end, I would like to uh, give you guys some space to discuss this, because it's a very recent technology, and it has the potential to change the way we do financial transactions, and not only financial transactions. So I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. First, uh, the definition. Uh, as far as I know, there is not an official definition in the dictionary, but this is one of the proposed ones, and I think it suits quite well. So it's a digital currency that uses cryptography for security, and uh, cryptocurrencies are generally anonymous and not issued by any central authority. This anonymous part, we'll talk a little uh, about it later. It's not that straightforward. But the, the part here is uh, that there is no central authority that controls these currencies. So. What's the big deal? Why is it important? And um, one of the reasons is that transactions are irreversible, fast, and have low fees. So if you go through PayPal, usually you have to pay 3%, 2%. And uh, right now, with cryptocurrencies, there is almost no fee, or really no fee. Um, and they are very fast to uh, broadcast all over the world. You don't have to wait for PayPal. Or, or if you do a bank wire, to a guy in another country, you have to wait three days. This is almost instantaneous. Um, another thing is that it's universal within the internet. So as long as you have an internet connection, you have, or you can have uh, a Bitcoin wallet if you want. Um, and in this day and age, it might seem to us that any of us can get a, a bank account. And it's, that's universal, right? But it's not really like that. Many countries, uh, you can't really have access to this uh, way of change, uh, changing money between people online. And uh, Bitcoin is really universal in that anyone can join th this network. Then the, this is uh, one of the most important parts, is that it's decentralized. And what it means is that there is no central point for which your transactions go. If you go through PayPal, you have to are subjected to PayPal's rules. If they don't want you to send money to WikiLeaks or something like that, you cannot send um, same thing with banks, and uh, usually b banks are under the regulation of governments. They have to follow certain rules, and here you can send money to anyone and in anywhere in the world. Also, um, this is all what I was talking about, that uh, the supply of coins is not dictated by any single organism, and the algorithm is what decides how many coins there are, uh, how often they are released, into the wild. So this is the most common example that everyone has heard about. This is Bitcoin. Bitcoin was uh, released in 2009 by a guy called Satoshi Nakamoto. And um, this guy, no one knows who he is. Uh, and it's really incredible that for years, people have been trying to idealize this uh, distributed uh, currency system. But in 2009, this guy came up alone, uh, published a white paper on this. And then things started rolling from there. And for you to have an idea of the impact of uh, this currency, this is the price over the last, so it's since October 11. 
so 2011. You can see the price of Bitcoin was nearly zero dollars per Bitcoin, and it went up almost to 1,200. Um, and this is a, not only a sign of the faith that there is in that Bitcoin has a use. But also that uh, uh, it can be used as a means to tra uh, transmit value from one person to the other because the coins really have value. Oh, I also forgot to mention that even though you might uh, see that one coin is worth right now maybe $500, you can send less than one Bitcoin and you can divide it up to 100 million. So you can send just a small percentage if you want to pay something that costs even a fraction of a cent, you can do that. So we can think of um, Bitcoin as a public ledger. And what is this ledger? Ledger is like an accounting book that every node in this decentralized uh, network has. Everyone has a copy of this. Um, and a simple way to think about, about it is that it has the names of people and the amo amount of Bitcoins that, that they have. In reality, it's not that simple. But for now, we can just think that every node in the, in the network has one of these things. So you are connected to various peers, and um, uh, when transactions occur, they are transmitted from one peer to the next, and they incorporate it into that ledger. Um, each um, person um, can have addresses, and these are like bank addresses, or the, the, we use uh, NIBs to, to tra transfer money from one person to the other, or in PayPal, we use the email address. And here we have these addresses. And they can have uh, between 27 and 34 alphanumeric characters. And um, they are generated via public key cryptography. Okay? Um, also, any user can generate uh, any number of addresses that it wants to. So if you want to generate 20 or 100, you can, you can have one transaction for each sale that you make on your website, for instance. And uh, just to, to give a, a little... Um, intro here. I'm not going to talk about public cryptography. Uh, I'm going to think that you guys know more or less what it is. But uh, basically, you have a private and a public key, and you can encrypt stuff with your private key, and then decrypt it with your public key. So you give away your public key to someone, and they can verify. Oh, okay. Either way. So, you can encrypt it, and uh, and both ways, you can encrypt with your public, decrypt with your private, and the other way around. So um, here we have a, an example of a transaction. And uh, there's Alice and Bob. Uh, I'm not going to put the full address there, but uh, you can uh, imagine the, the full uh, 27 uh, alphanumeric uh, key there. And it's just like a bank transaction. You send 20 Bitcoin from Alice to Bob, and it's goes down on your balance, and on Bob's balance, it goes up. Um, in reality, the, these uh, transactions in Bitcoin, uh, they, are, they have a digital signature to make sure that you were the one that made these transactions. So if you initiate the transaction, you have to sign it with your keys. And uh, in the, the way that this works in Bitcoin, this is the heart of Bitcoin, is that uh, you refer to a previous transaction that you have received. So imagine that before Celso has sent Alice 20 Bitcoins, right? So now I want to send Bob 20 Bitcoins. And uh, I'm going to refer to that uh, transaction that was previously and spent, now spent. So I cannot use the same money twice. Um, and now uh, Bob has this transaction that he can refer to later. So what happens if you want to send 20 Bitcoins, but no one ever, ever sent you um, just a transaction with 20? Maybe they sent you 15, and then they sent you 7. What happens? What happens is that you create two transactions, one with 20 and the other with 2, and you send that money back to yourself. And then you spend both the previous transactions. So before I told you that uh, Bitcoin was basically account and balance, but that's not really true. Uh, the way that it works is that there are a bunch of blocks. And these blocks have all the transactions that's ever occurred, ever, ever since Bitcoin was introduced. So when you install the, the, the wallet, the Bitcoin wallet on your computer, you basically have to download the whole transaction history over the years. 
and you can go through the transactions and uh, um, you can verify that no one is spending the same transaction twice. You can go one by one and check, check this. That's why when you download, the, I, I don't know if you try but when you download the, the Bitcoin wallet, it takes a few hours uh, to update to the current status of the network. Also, these blocks have an interesting thing, which is uh, that they contain um, the hash of the previous block and the hash of the current block. So this means that um, blocks come one after the other, and the uh, only block only has one previous block, and uh, there, there are no forks in the network. OK, so this is an example of the blockchain. To the right, we have the most recent uh, block with the transaction that have occurred in the last few minutes. Um, and as you can see in the, the first part where it says block 100, we have these transactions. And the reason that Bitcoin is quite safe is that you cannot just go back and change a previous transaction. So you, you might say that Bob didn't uh, transfer 20 Bitcoins to Alice, transferred 50, right? So this changes the block's hash. And that makes all the further uh, blocks further on, on the chain also invalid. So no one can just go back and change one hash and just pretend that everything is all right because if you go through uh, the, the, the whole blockchain, you'll see that something is wrong. Also, um, I said that there, there were no forks in the network, but it might happen that uh, two blocks are generated uh, at nearly the same time because remember that this is a decentralized currency. So not all the peers have the same state at each moment. So these blocks are generated by um, different nodes in the, in the network, and they might decide that different transactions go in, in the current block. And what happens is that they use that current block as um, the, pr the, the current one. So half of the network might use one block, half of the network might use the other one. But the fastest one to get another consecutive block that will be the chosen one by the, the, the whole network. So this prevents a problem where some nodes create one block, another uh, nodes create a different block, and then the network becomes splitted. So each node will try to be on the, on the fork that has the most number of uh, blocks. So in terms of, of mining, this, this is the process uh, by which you create these blocks, these uh, collections of transactions. Um, and uh, what you do is uh, to use a proof of work algorithm. So creating these blocks is not easy. And that's why you can just create 50 blocks and then hope that your fork will be the, the correct one. It takes some time, and this time is adjusted by, by the network. So what, what you do is that you hash the, the whole block of, of, the, of, the, of text that's in the transaction block, and you add a number to it. And you hope that this number will meet a set of rules that is established by the, by the Bitcoin protocol. That set of rules, so uh, you can see here, uh, this is governed by a thing called difficulty. And uh, as more and more nodes try to um, hash these blocks or mine these blocks, um, the faster it will be because um, all you have to do is create a block that starts with a certain number of zeros. It's not this simple, but for uh, simplicity's sake, let's uh, pretend that it is. So imagine that you have to generate a block that starts with four zeros. So you add number zero in the end of the, the, the block, you generate a hash, it doesn't start with four zeros. Try different numbers, different numbers. By 4250, you finally get to a hash that corresponds to the current difficulty level. So imagine that not a lot of people are mining uh, the hash rate of the network. The, the rate at which you can generate these hashes is not very high. So the difficulty has to be lower in order for you to maintain the Bitcoins um, 10 minutes per block. So in Bitcoin, um, it is intended to generate a block every 10 minutes. So, but it, you, you can start thinking, what if I add a, ton of computers to the network that will make computation faster and I can generate blocks much faster, right? So every two weeks, the difficulty, so the number of zeros that you have to generate, 
goes up, depending, up or down, depending on the hash rate of the, the, the whole system. So in here you can see that uh, the red light is a difficulty and it adjusts itself on a regular basis at two week intervals. And uh, both in uh, blue and green you have the hash rate of the network. So as you add more miners to the network and it becomes easier to mine, the algorithm uh, bumps the difficulty up and then it's uh, not as easy to find these hashes. So the purpose of this is to keep the block at uh, 10 minutes intervals. Um, so still regarding mining, um, this is where the money in Bitcoin comes from. So you heard that people are making tons of money mining, right? And uh, mining is just this process of generating the hash that creates a block that can be added to the blockchain. And uh, mi the miner that finds this hash is rewarded. And uh, right now the, the, the reward is 25 Bitcoin. But uh, in the beginning it was 50. So every four years this uh, reward goes down until you no longer get rewards from mining. That will happen in 2033. And uh, the number of Bitcoins, the maximum number is 21 million. So this is also one of the reasons why Bitcoin value is so high. It's because this is a finite, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, property that people have, but it's like gold, it's not infinite. So um, it, that tends to drive the price upwards. Not only that, it tends to make people not want to spend them because they think that the longer it passes, the more valuable the, the, their bitcoins will be, right? Um, in terms of uh, mining rigs, uh, in the beginning it was really easy to mine with your CPU and get tons of bitcoins like that. Uh, but as things started getting a bit more serious, uh, people started mining with their GPUs, their graphics cards. Then they went to FPGAs and finally, very maybe not very recently, but recently, they uh, came up with these ASICs. This is specialized hardware just to compute these hashes. It's incredibly fast. And uh, if you compare the order of magnitude, you can see that it's not very useful to go and mine Bitcoin with your laptop right now, because you're going to be competing against these guys that have lots of ASICs machines, not just one. But uh, um, that's why here you can see that the hash rate has been rising so dramatically because these ASICs have been introduced in the system and they can mine at very high hash rates. And uh, that basically means that uh, Bitcoins are only distributed by these guys that have these powerful machines. Forgot to mention about pool mining. So uh, even if you have a single graphics card, you might want to give it a go, right? But trying to find the block on your own is not a good way. You should probably go to pool mining. And what this is basically a bunch of people that gather and mine. And if the, one of them gets uh, the block re reward, which right now it's pretty high, 25 bitcoins times $500, you do the math. Um, so what they do is that they distribute it for every member in the pool, depending on their hash rate. So if there's a guy that has a lot of hash rate, he gets most of the rewards. And usually these pools will end up taking a little bit, maybe 1% of the rewards. But uh, nowadays, most people don't even solo mine. And most clients don't, don't even allow that. So they're all made to use pools. And we end up with this kind of stuff. So people that got, got in really early and made quite a, a lot of money from the rising value of Bitcoin have reinvested that money. And these are all GPUs, if I can see correctly. And uh, they have these huge mining farms, maybe at home. They're spending thousands of dollars in electricity. And it's not really very good for the environment. So this is one of the problems um, that we currently have. But uh, with the advent of ASICs, it even becomes even more difficult. So some of the problems of Bitcoin. Um, when you have your wallet, you have both your private and public keys in there. And if you lose them or someone steals them, you're out of luck. You cannot get those keys back. And that means that you have no access 
to your private keys. Another thing that can happen is that someone might, might steal your private keys, but you might not be aware of it, and they didn't do anything with your bitcoins. Afterwards, you get a big transaction from someone, and then they have the keys, and then they, they can uh, transfer that money to some of their accounts. So there are many um, viruses that go and search your hard drive just for your wallet files and try to get your private keys. And it's a, a very big war, uh, problem because if you want regular people to use this, it cannot be hanging over their heads that they are going to lose everything if uh, they catch a virus in their system, right? We don't lose all our money right now if the bank uh, gets infected with uh, some sort of uh, malware or it has a, a hacker goes in there, right? So th that's one of the, the, the problems of th this type of currencies is that if you're out of luck, you're out of, out of luck. Well, in uh, centralized systems, there's always some security in terms of not losing everything you have. Another issue is that although it's uh, promoted as being anonymous, it's not really anonymous because I told you that um, the blockchain is just a collection of every transaction that's ever, ever took place since the beginning of Bitcoin. And that means that anyone can go and check who sent money to whom. Although there are no names attached to the addresses, right? But if somehow you let it slip that that account is yours, someone can link uh, a public key to your, um, your identity, they can basically see everything that you've been doing with Bitcoin. That's uh, a real problem. And uh, another issue uh, that has been happening lately, it's uh, some severe consequences, is double spending attack. And also, uh, it's uh, magnified by this 51% attack, which I'm going to briefly talk about. Um, in terms of double spending, imagine that you have a bad guy, Trudy, and he wants to pay for something that Alice is selling. So what he does is that he creates a regular Bitcoin transaction. I send 20 Bitcoins to, to Alice. Um, and I'm going to reference this previous transaction that is unspent. But then I create at the same time uh, um, a new transaction that also references the, the same previous transaction. So both these, um, these transaction, one is being sent to Alice, it's a good one, but now you're sending the money to yourself again, spending the same previous transaction. What happens is that um, the propagation of these messages through the network is not done in the same way. And uh, you could be um, propagating this bad um, transaction to some nodes and the good transaction to other nodes, including Alice's node. So Alice might see that uh, the transaction has occurred, she has received it, but in reality, other nodes are seeing that uh, a different tr transaction took place where you sent the money to yourself. And um, if the, these nodes that have the, the red or the, the malicious uh, transaction, if these nodes are able to generate the block that contains this transaction, then the money that Alice receives will never be incorporated into the blockchain. Because it, once uh, you spend a previous transaction, you cannot spend it again. So uh, further attempts of introducing the, the good transaction into the blockchain will be rejected by the network because you see this money has already been spent, I'm not going to spend it again. Just uh, a brief mention about altcoins, alternative coins. These have been showing up uh, since 2011. And uh, as you might be aware, Bitcoin is an open source project. Even, th even though we don't know who the guy is that made it, uh, the code is open source and is be has been being maintained by a series of uh, developers. And uh, in 2011, uh, although it was not the, the first altcoin to show up, it was on one of the most important ones because it imp implements a different type of proof of work algorithm. While uh, uh, Bitcoin uses SA SHA-256 for the hashing of the blocks, um, Litecoin uses a different type of algorithm. And this new type of algorithm requires a little amount of memory for every hash. And uh, what this does is prevent these ASIC miners, these hardware miners, from 
hashing at a, a, a really high speed because it, you need to have tons of memory to be able to do all the calculations. So this, this was a huge break from Bitcoin in that the network was no longer on the mercy of uh, ASIC miners that were getting all the rewards from them. Um, also, uh, a different thing is that uh, the block time from Litecoin is only 2.5 minutes, where uh, uh, Bitcoin takes 10 minutes to confirm a transaction. So imagine that I send you a transaction. It will only get incorporated into the blockchain after 10 minutes. You'd have to wait for 10 minutes to be reasonably sure that the transaction was not fake, it was not malicious, right? Even though um, with the 51% attack that I forgot to mention before, if you control more than half of the hash rates of the network, you might be quicker to generate a, a series of blocks that contain malicious transactions and you could ex execute a double spending attack uh, in an easier way. And this can be done using pools if pools are, have more than 50% of the, the hash rate of the system, uh, it might be trivial for them to create this double spending attack much easier. Um, so this block time of 2.5 minutes uh, is an advantage because uh, the, the transactions are confirmed into the blockchain much sooner. And uh, right now in terms of market cap, uh, Litecoin is uh, the, currently the, the number two cryptocurrency. Then we have uh, Dogecoin. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but some guy basically forked Litecoin on GitHub, placed a dog in the face of the coin, released it. I mean, it's not that trivial, but um, there are some, some changes. But this guy made a joke with a coin, and uh, it has been growing at a rate that's unlike any other uh, cryptocurrency before. Um, and. Uh, a huge different be difference between Dogecoin and Litecoin and other and other cryptocurrencies such as um, Bitcoin is that there is no coin limit. While in Bitcoin you are limited to 21 million coins forever, and if coins are lost, they are lost. Um, in Dogecoin, you have a maximum of 100 billion, much more, until 2014. So the time frame is completely different. And uh, after that, there will be five billion. Uh, Doge coins per year, so this will keep the miners interested in uh, mining. Where after two f 2033, in the case of Bitcoin, miners will no longer get rewards for mining. Their only rewards will be the fees that uh, you pay for a transaction, and those are optional. So after 2033, you might say that you want to pay 0.01 of transaction fee in a in a transaction, otherwise the miners wouldn't even care for it and will not include it in the new block. So the, uh, a difference from this kind of uh, um, currency is that you will always have a, a reward for miners and it will keep them mining and basically keeping the network healthy. Because if you have lots of miners, it's more difficult to execute an attack. Also, uh, if you ever visited this uh, Reddit community, of Dogecoin, you can see that people are just giving away money like crazy. They are funding all these different projects. So the, remember, this coin is only five months old. It has already don they donated all this amount of money to several causes, such as building water wells in Africa, or, or giving uh, dogs for kids with uh, special needs. And they even helped fund uh, the trip from the Jamaican bobsled team to Sochi because they are underdogs, so I think that there's a, something there. Also, there was a big test of um, Dogecoins in Christmas. Dogecoins, uh, Dogecoin was released maybe in the beginning of uh, December or late uh, November, and then in the Christmas day, 30 million Dogecoin were, uh, were stolen, or actually more than that. But the community has gathered and donated 30 million to give to, to those people that lost all their Dogecoin. And they also recently, maybe last week, they sponsored the car in NASCAR. So it's really strange times to be in, in terms of cryptocurrencies. There are also uh, a variety of other cryptocurrencies. Um, back there you have Coinia West. Someone put a Kanye West face on a fish, and then Kanye West's lawyers went after them and they ran away. It's kind of strange. 
you have pure coin, you have name coin, which tries to basically create a DNS system with uh, cryptocurrency. Um, have Aurora coin, which is a, a coin that was made for the Icelandic people. And then recently, uh, Crypto Escudo was created in Portugal. Although it's quite interesting that these coins come pre mined. So the authors of, uh, in, in, not all of these coins, but for instance, Crypto Escudo, I was reading in their website, they have pre mined 45% of all the coins that will ever be available. So if you start mining Crypto Escudo now, you can be sure that the, uh, the, the, the authors of this coin already have a fat stack of coins. So you might not um, be very. Yeah, that, that, that's what they say, right? Uh, that, that they will give away to, to the Portuguese people. Yeah, that's what Aurora Con says. And um, let's see, it's too early to say. In terms of what is happening uh, right now with Bitcoin, and not only Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are a number of ATMs being developed and already being deployed all over the world. You can go there and place euros or dollars and it gives you a paper wallet. And you can, um, a paper wallet basically has uh, in a piece of paper your private and public keys. You can just import them in your um, desktop client and you have those coins. There is also Silk Road, which you probably have heard about. This was uh, an online store that you can only access using Tor. So it's a bit shady that you had to use Bitcoins and then you had to be on Tor and you could buy all sorts of things like drugs. You can hire someone to kill someone. It was really uh, shady uh, and uh, basically it was taking full potential of the potential anonymizing aspect of both Tor and cryptocurrencies. But in the end, uh, it was human error that led the creator of Silk Road to let his identity slip and uh, the FBI went there and seized everything. There is also a lot of talks in terms of uh, regulation and leg le legislation, um, particularly in China and Russia and in the United States there has been a lot of controversy. Uh, Bitcoin has been banned from China, then unbanned and banned. This goes on forever. Um, and no one really knows what Bitcoin is. Some people say it's property. Some people say it's currency. Some people say it's nothing. So do you pay tax on it or you don't? What do you do with the gains, monetary gains that you make from Bitcoin? Uh, this is still too early to, to, to say how it's going to end up. But um, it, there has been a, a lot of talk and particularly the, the United States, I think that they are turning around and in liking Bitcoin. Maybe it's because they have access to all the transactions that's ever occurred, I don't know. That could be a, a motivation. There's also point of sale systems in shops. You can go and order a burger and pay directly like we've done with a, a mail wallet today. Although, um, with Bitcoin, these uh, 10 minute block times make it a bit awkward. You have to wait there for 10 minutes for the merchant to verify that your order has been added to the blockchain. And usually it's a good practice to wait at least six blocks to make sure that no one can uh, reverse these transactions or create a fork with uh, more blocks than uh, you are currently looking at. There is also this um, exchanges where you can go and purchase bitcoins with dollars or purchase dogecoins with bitcoins or purchase bitcoins with dogecoins uh, you can do everything one of the largest ones one of the first ones is mount gox and uh, recently um, they lost all 700,000 bitcoins that they have i think which is almost 300 or 400 million dollars and there is no regulation on this so these people just lost their bitcoins that's it and um, one of the aspects that I would like to provoke here in terms of discussion that, is that uh, these decentralized currencies allow you to do, send money to anyone, but there are really no rules of what happens when something, something goes wrong. And uh, Bitcoin is very advocated by libertarians that they don't want government to control what they do, they just want to use whatever they want. But then something like this happens, and what happens to your coins if there are no laws? So if Bitcoin is nothing in the eyes of the law, what happens to this? So 
this brings the, the end of the presentation. I would like to pass the word to you guys because this is a really recent technology and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, although I want to give out uh, 10,000 Dogecoin to anyone that wants it. Um, so just ping me on my Twitter and then I'll just ran, ran all the, the names in random.org or something and I'll just leave this here and I'll pass on the word to you guys. And here, here is a paper wallet with 10,000 Dogecoin if you guys want. Hi. Uh, if I got correctly for the double spending attack, you need to send the money to yourself, right? Yes. So is there any valid reason for allowing sending money to yourself? Yes. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, we showed that if you want to spend money that came from transactions that don't add up to exactly the amount that you want to send. So imagine you want to send 20 bitcoins, but previously you only received 10 and 15. You have to spend both those transactions that amount to 25 bitcoins, right? So you have to send those, um, the remaining five bitcoins to yourself so that you keep the change from the transaction. This is because the way that transactions are recorded and they are, are used, you have to spend previous transactions and they might not add to the correct value. Um, so you said that one of the devices used uh, to mine bitcoins are GPUs. Yes. And as far as I know, um, the GPUs used are exclusively AMD GPUs. Is there any specific reason why, why uh, NVIDIA GPUs are not used? Uh, the way that the architecture of AMD GPUs uh, is done allows this hashing process to occur much faster than in uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA's architecture. I don't know the exact details, uh, but I, I can tell you that nowadays people are spending a lot of money just buying AMD GPUs uh, because it's, it, the, the, the hash rates are much faster. Hi. Um do, do, do you believe it's, it's possible for these kind of cryptocurrencies to ever reach the general public? Uh, I'll just say one thing with this, which is uh, tangible currencies have evolved mm -hmm. along the years and the, the centuries as something that people understand because they see, they first they see trades, then they see paper money or, or coins shifting hands, and then they see their, their money being saved in the bank although behind the bank there's all the whole you know, strange system, but they feel that their money is, is there and their money is moving and they know where it is. Do you believe that something that requires some technical knowledge to believe in can ever reach the general, general public? That, that's the most challenging thing right now because it's uh, very techy oriented. You have to know your way around computers to use these things safely, right? Um, and uh, these things that happened in the past, for instance, with Silk Road, where people were ordering other people to kill uh, someone, paying bitcoins, all these things add to the negative uh, aspect of the, the whole thing. And people are kind of, I don't know if I want to get into this. Um, but things like Dogecoin, if you go to the Reddit community, you can see people of all ages. You, I've seen people there with 80 years getting into cryptocurrencies just because there's a dog and it's friendly and they think maybe this is not so bad but uh, I think that the, the main way that a cryptocurrency can get accepted into mainstream society is if you have sellers accepting it. If you go to every shop and there's someone accepting Bitcoin, people will start noticing and they will want to use it because it's practical. So it depends on the adoption of merchants, it depends on the adoption of uh, people that want to buy with it. So it, it will either work or not, but I think it's too early to tell. Hi, Miguel. 
uh, where do you think the value of Bitcoin comes from? I've heard that it comes from the electric current spent when mining. Other people saying that it is a bubble. What is your opinion? It's a, it's a mix of those. So um, the thing is that Bitcoins are being produced at a much slower pace than people that want to get into the system. Uh, if you want to get some Bitcoins, right now the value is very high because a lot of people want to get in, right? So it's a, it's a traditional market demand and uh, offer. And uh, although uh, there, there is some, something to it about the cost of mining, although in the first few years pe people were just spending money in mining and electricity, they weren't getting any return. The value was almost zero just because we found it cool, right? Um, and somehow the, the, their, their risk also brings value to the coin. Um, and uh, I think that mostly the, the, the fact that people want to get in on this because it could be the next big thing and that it has a limited supply, they want to get in now because they think it might go even higher, it drives the, the, the price a lot. And um, it's one of the most volatile things in uh, finance right now, it's cryptocurrencies, the, the price goes up and down, can drop 20% in one day, then go up 50% in one day, it's, it's crazy. But uh, we ha we'll have to, to, to see, it will st stable out. And uh, although we might be in a bubble right now, I think that the true value will show itself over uh, the years as more merchants adopt it. But I think that right now the value might be a little inflated. Uh, hi, uh, quick question. Uh, you talk about the volat volatility of the coin, and uh, what would be your uh, uh, ideas uh, in terms of the market? Because, for example, now China uh, voted against it again, and uh, you had a big uh, around 10% of decrease uh, of the value. Uh, and to have it to the open community, to have it to the open person, to start using a coin where they don't know too much about it, and they only see a really up and down market. What would be your steps to more or less control that, for example? I think that in, the, in this first phase is very difficult to, to counter that. Um, and uh, you said that when China prohibited Bitcoin, the value went down. But then after a few days, it was back up and then back down. Uh, so right now, Bitcoin is not a very good store of value. If you want to keep your money safe, it's not Bitcoin right now because it just goes up and down. And then you won't be able to sleep when it crashes 50% in one day. Um, but I think it has to, to come from time and merchant adoption. And as these things settle out, don't forget that this was uh, put into a, a global perspective from the start. So this is very new and it's already been used in all of the world. So a lot of things can affect it. These regulations in one country or another. People are unsure of what might happen. Some people are bullish and they think that it will be $40,000 each coin. So this is what drives the price up and down. Some people think it's going to be awesome. Some people think it's going to be crap. And the um, market hasn't really decided what's the, the fair value of Bitcoin. Hello, Miguel. Uh, thanks for doing this, this talk. I have two, two questions. You, you talked uh, several times about the network, but I, I, didn't, I didn't really grasp what the network is and how, how the things propagate. Is it a peer-to-peer -peer network? Yes. Are there, is there a, uh, okay. It is. So, so, so you have a, a wallet in your computer, and when you start it up, it connects to peers around you. And uh, these becomes, become your neighbors, right? And you tr uh, pass on transaction information from one peer to the other. Okay, thanks. And the second question is about the mining process itself. You, you showed uh, some strings and you, you were trying to uh, generate uh, candidate hashes that matched uh, some prefix with the number of, of zeros. Yes. But uh, could you please be a little more specific about, uh, is there a, a, a predefined hash, a predefined string we have to modify? Can we just ran generate random blobs of data to match some hashes and after we found a valid hash how does it how does this new bitcoin is added to the to the existing network is there some metadata that reference the blob mm -hmm. and the hash of the blob if you could be a little more specific sure thanks so well i i put here hello world the text that is hashed is the 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 text of the block so you say let's create a block with these 100 transactions 
and you hash it with the, this number, the nouns in the end. But you have to change these nouns to make the hash uh, follow these rules of having a certain number of zeros, right? So uh, you can just generate generate blobs of data that are the nouns. Uh, I'm not sure if it is only uh, an integer number or if it can be anything. But this thing that you uh, attach onto the end is just so that you generate different hashes and one of them will luckily be uh, the one that starts with more zeros. When you have found that, you start uh, dispersing it to your neighbors and they will accept that as the block because it fits the, the rules, right? So they can hash easily the, the block. So you say, I found the nouns for this block and the nouns is 4250. So you send it to your, all your neighbors and they can just, with one uh, execution of the hash function, they can verify that this nouns works because you say the nouns is 4250, they add the 4250 to the end of the block, the hash that they see, this is the correct uh, answer. But it shows that you had a lot of work previously trying to guess them, right? But it only takes one uh, guess uh, to see that that number was the correct one. And regarding the previous question, hi. Um, and if two people find the same thing? Yes. So the, the same uh, nouns or uh, the same exact number, they can find um, different numbers for different blocks. So not everyone is trying to hash the same block. If you are in the other part of the world, you might be looking at a different set of transactions that you want to put into a block, right? So. Uh, what happens when two different blocks are created is that there is a fork in the there is a fork in the blockchain. So there are these two candidate solutions, and uh, the neighbors of the guy that decided on the first one will stick to that one, and the neighbors of the guy that found the other the, the bottom one will stick to that one. So we will have actually in the, the Bitcoin network two different blockchains. The last block will be different depending on where you are in the network. Okay, and uh, how this is decided is that if one of the guys that is following the top fork finds the, the next block faster than the other guys find the next block, like this, then that will become the default uh, blockchain for everyone in the network. They will see there's a, an alternative that is better than mine. I'm going to adopt that one. So the transactions that have been put in the, to this bottom block go back into the uh, unconfirmed transactions of the whole network. There is a list of unconfirmed transactions and they might go into the next block after that one is accepted, the, the last one is accepted. Okay. Uh, do you believe Namecoin as what it takes to replace DNS to be a good solution for 21st century DNS? Um, I think that Namecoin is a really interesting thought experiment of what you can actually achieve with this Bitcoin system that is not just currency, it has other uses. And I think that as that has a first prototype of what can be done uh, with the, the blockchain technology and basically decentralizing this uh, ledger, I think it's a, a very interesting uh, thing. I'm not sure that it will disrupt DNS because it's been used for so long that it's it's difficult to, to do this. You can look at IPv6 and the adoption is not that easy to go from IPv4 to, to IPv6, although we're getting there. But uh, uh, this shows that the Bitcoin protocol can be used to more than just uh, transactions of money. It can be used for microtransactions automatically between several computers. They can decide different things, bidding. Um, and uh, I think that that is possibly going to be the, the the most interesting part that comes out of Bitcoin, not just transferring money, but these uh, other uses that this distributed uh, ledger can have. So if you have a, a, a history of all the transactions of a different thing that's not money online and uh, it can be used reliably, that, that can be very interesting. Although it's hard to guess what kind of use cases, right? So, so early in the game. Yeah. Again, another question. What about the average propagation time of a Nash block across the whole network? Couldn't it be exploited too? Uh, yes, actually, that, that's what is exploited by this double spending attack. Let me put it here. So, 
imagine that you are the, the node on the left and you are making a transaction with the, the second node on the bottom and you use this effect that not all nodes are connected and they do not get the same information instantly. So you, you transmit ambiguous messages to each part of the network and if you happen to have more than 50% of the hash rate, you can be pretty sure that your block with the fake data is going to be uh, hashed first. So the, the, this matter of uh, not having a, an instantaneous connection with all the other nodes in the network is a bit of a problem. And that's why uh, people try not to give more than half of the hash rate to a single entity or pool in order to prevent this. Yeah, yeah but it, that is kind of luck, isn't it? Yes, it's a bit of luck. Yeah. And that's why people recommend that you wait at least for six blocks after the one where your transaction has occurred, right? I said pro quiz. Um, what's the state of the art on the uh, convergence time problem? Who's the, working on that and what's being done there? I, I don't do research in this area, so I'm not really sure of who are the, the guys that are making the, this kind of uh, research. But I know that there's a lot of research going into this, particularly um, on the type of uh, proof of work algorithms that are used. So these script type, there are, there are different ones. There's a new coin that uses 12 or nine different uh, hashing functions. So it becomes even more difficult for the, um, for the, uh, the ASICs to take over. But in terms of propagating the message through, through the network, I don't really know uh, what to say of, of the art. Hi again. Uh, do you believe that all the problems that are related with regulations and well, every, every problem around uh, cryptocurrencies will end up eventually being solved by banks themselves and negating this, the very issues that it was supposed to fix? So if you think of a perfect world where uh, governments don't have a say in what banks say, probably, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen that soon. And um, the, here, the, there are some problems with Bitcoin, sure. But the, the, the main advantage is that you don't have to go through a bank or PayPal or America, or they don't decide on what you can do with your money or with your transactions. It's decided by the, the network. So even if you solve those problems, maybe, uh, but I, I, I don't see how they can be solved. And if you, you still have central uh, identities or entities. Talking about banks adopting cryptocurrencies for okay. themselves and actually turning cryptocurrencies into the, the new standard. You know, the libertarians that say, well, we, want, we don't want banks. <laughs> then banks adopt cryptocurrencies <laughs> and we, ne we end up in the exact same. I, I place. think that there are some, uh, <laughs> even if banks adopt cryptocurrencies, they will not be able to control them. Even if they, they say, this is our coin, you have to use our coin. It's still being uh, regulated by the whole network and the algorithm. Um, but um, in terms of the banks um, creating or ad adopting cryptocurrencies, uh, I think that there are some problems with cryptocurrency that, that bank would not like to have. So the, the, the ledger, the, the history of transactions being public, but that's something that banks do not want. They want to keep transactions private because they respect your privacy, right? Unless you're the NSA. Um, so they don't want every client to know what the other clients are doing. And there's a, a different thing, which is you have to associate your identity with your bank account, right? If I know that you have that account, I can know every transaction that you've made because the ledger is public. So uh, the, the fact that you don't have to say, this is me, I'm using Bitcoin. You can just say, I'm using Bitcoin, I'm an anonymous person. That cannot be done with regular banks. You have to say, this is me, this is my address, this is my phone number. And th that would eventually uh, re uh, remove all anonymity from the, the protocol. <laughs>